In the high TC superconductors, there are two types of current density that we have to consider. One is the intragrain currents, the currents which circulate within a grain, and these are dependent on pinning. The other current are the intergrain currents, the currents that flow between grains, and these depend upon the relative orientation of the neighbouring grains. So I think more than flux pinning, I mean there are a lot of interesting fundamental differences in flux pinning between the materials, uh, but in fact one could say that flux pinning is not the limitation yet in the high TC materials. It would be maybe increased a little bit if flux pinning would be better, would just give even higher currents and so on. But the real limitation uh, is... Why be so mature? We do not completely comprehend why those materials are so damn good. We still don't understand this completely. We understand what weakens the high temperature superconductor. Co-coded conductors, there's all the big issues of uh, grain alignment, grain texturing, grain boundaries, current paths, and knowing what happens in high magnetic fields. Here is our wire, a superconductor, and contained within this are many, many grains, you see. So you can see here exactly that uh, there is, if I'm going to pass a current along here from one end to the other, I have to cross all of these grain boundaries. The fact that in order to get any current across the grain boundaries, you essentially have to minimize the misorientation almost to the point at which the grain boundaries disappear. Superconductors usually consist of uh, polycrystalline materials with grain boundaries with non-superconducting grains and the current that has to flow through a superconductor uh, then has to percolate similar to the water percolating through a coffee machine. In high TC superconducting conductors not only in-plane percolation is important but also the out-of-plane current transfer between well-aligned grains. Here is a simulation of the current transfer between two brick type grains with continuously increasing anisotropy from 1 to 60. It is clear that for highly anisotropic ITC superconductors, only area adjacent to thickness to the contact is used. Percolation theory is actually a much more general theory. It can be used for coffee, for water or oil in a sediment. It can be used for diffusion of information in financial markets. So this image here represents a superconducting film which is actually not one superconducting grain, but it's a polycrystalline material. And then the, you find that some uh, grains are better than others and some grain boundaries are better than others for current transfer. And therefore the current is percolating through the superconductor. The second image here is a magneto-optical image which shows a superconductor, again polycrystalline, in a magnetic field. And the magnetic field penetrates the superconductor along the weakest grain boundaries. Percolation theory can be broadly divided in two types of problems. One is side percolation and one is bond percolation. And for superconductors we can identify the grains with the sides and the grain boundaries with the bonds. If you want to write a computer simulation for a superconductor, you can either model the superconductor as a regular grain, like hexagons or squares, which is simple but also less complex to compute. Or you can use a real grain boundary network and simulate this as a resistor network. Each grain boundary as a pair of resistors, just because this makes a linear uh, optimization problem. And then you get a large network, which can either be a regular network or built by real grains, which are irregular. And then from this model, you can calculate the IV curve of a superconductor. And you also can calculate where the, f the magnetic flux will penetrate into the material. So in my simulation, we see the magnetic field penetrating the superconductor and at the critical current we have one flux channel penetrating but then uh, very shortly after we have multiple channels penetrating the superconductor at various grain boundaries. Currently we have a really big variety uh, of different possibilities to set up and to build up a coated conductor with a good uh, critical current density starting from uh, different substrates, rabbits, I-bed. This uh, points of uh, current percolation coated conductors holds both for the rabbits based uh, coated conductors and the IBA based coated conductors. 
And to make it a little bit uh, more clear, let's uh, sketch uh, the surface of a coated conductor with uh, quite large uh, grain sizes of the size of around 20 micrometer. That's a rapids coated conductor and uh, the IBET coated conductor has uh, much much smaller grains. So you, they have grains with a diameter less than a micrometer. Uh, nevertheless, if you look at the cross-section of these uh, IBAT uh, tapes, they have columnar growth from the bottom of the substrate to the surface of the film. And these columnar uh, structure uh, has the effect that also the current has to follow such an uh, in-plane percolation path as it is necessary in the coated conductor based on rapids. Let's now analyze the IV characteristics, for example, of a 4 degree low angle grain boundary. Um, up to the critical current of uh, this grain boundary, uh, you have uh, zero voltage, and uh, above uh, IC, uh, the IV curve increases linearly uh, like a resistor. The IV curve of uh, the grain itself, of the YPCO grain itself, um, behaves completely different. You have also uh, zero uh, voltages up to IC, but you observe a power law behavior with the uh, increasing current. One of the central problems of utilizing these high temperature superconductors, namely the obstacles placed by the grain boundaries, but in fact it's worth saying that this was uh, not at all accepted uh, in the early days at all because people, some people were so enthusiastic about the uh, about the potentiality of the high temperature superconductors that, oh well perhaps the grain boundaries are obstacles but that's because they're full of dirt or junk or second phases or things like this. It really took a lot of effort in fact to discover that uh, this is a fundamental physics question and I have to say that the fundamental physics of what's going on at the grain boundary is still not absolutely clear because we do not understand at the truly atomic scale where these properties are determined exactly what the influence of the atomic arrangement is on the superconducting properties. And so when we look at the structure of a grain boundary we unfortunately find a situation where yttrium barium copper oxide exhibits a maximum doping which puts it somewhere here and the grain boundary then is on this side so here's a grain boundary of yttrium barium copper oxide. And you can see its TC is lower, but much worse than this is the fact that the carrier density is much lower, and therefore structural imperfections which occur at the grain boundary are not well screened at all. But we search for another approach is how to increase the critical current density. One way we did this was by chemical doping the material. We found out that if you replace yttrium in YBZO with calcium, you would get a large increase in the critical current density at low temperatures, which is very good. But on the other hand, you reduce the critical temperature of the superconductor, and it's below 77K, which is the appropriate temperature for the high DC superconductors. We've overcome this problem of reduction of the critical temperature by introducing such multilayers of undoped and doped material. The idea behind this approach is that the calcium in this calcium doped layers can diffuse along the grain boundary into the grain boundary because of a much more higher grain boundary diffusion and incorporate calcium at the grain boundary, which will improve the grain boundary locally but leave the bulk material untouched. And therefore, you see, we have an increase in the critical current density in the whole temperature range for such bilayer and trilayer configurations and at 77k you see we have an increase in the critical current density of about a factor of 7 and still the critical temperature which is important is still as high as 19 Kelvin. We in Augsburg thought about other 
ways to improve the critical current density in such coated conductors not only by growing alignments, modify the microstructure of the tape in order to get high critical current densities. And we found one method. This is uh, having grains with a high aspect ratio means elongated grains which are much more longer than wide. If you have such elongated grains in the substrate of a coated conductor, you will introduce large grain boundary areas. This grain boundary can carry a large critical current because the area of the grain boundary is very large. Despite the improvement of the critical current transfer by elongated grain boundaries, there can be reduction of the critical current if the grain boundaries are parallel to magnetic field, as it is in electromagnetic windings. It is well documented that a substantial reduction of the critical current value for the low angle grain boundaries parallel to the external magnetic field does exist. Therefore, the best option is elongated hexagonal grain microstructure as presented in pictures. And real difficulties occur when the screening length, the Thomas Fermi screening length uh, of the boundary is comparable to the superconducting coherence length, which is unfortunately true for most of the useful high temperature superconducting uh, oxides. We can define what is called an irreversibility field, which corresponds to the bulk critical current density goes to zero. So this would be the properties of the grain. And what one can see is a very interesting characteristic, which is that if you plot the grain boundary as a function of magnetic field, we see that in weak fields it starts out a long way below the grain, but in fact it looks as if one goes to a crossover. Coated conductors should show crossover in many situations between grain boundary dominated behavior and in grain dominated behavior. Don't forget the pinning in the grains, that's the message. As we increase the density of vortices in the material, actually it turns out that the properties of the grain decrease faster than the properties of the grain boundary. So the reason for that is uh, due to uh, yeah, dislocations inside the grain boundary. And uh, when you sketch, for example, such a really uh, low degree grain boundary, with a grain boundary angle of 4 degree, then this grain boundary consists of a linear array of dislocations inside the grain boundary. And these dislocations can act as uh, pinning centers and due to this linear arrangement this magnetic field dependence uh, is given. Um, so when we look now directly to the overall behavior of coated conductor, then it is clear that at low magnetic fields, the critical current is limited uh, by the behavior of uh, the grain boundary, up to the point where one observes this uh, crossover. Above this point at higher magnetic fields, the grain itself acts as a limiting mechanism and reduces JC.